My name is Kasia Malinowska, and I direct the Global Drug Policy Program at the Open Society Foundation. Um, as many of you know, I am sure, we are um, in 2021, uh, a year where we will be commemorating, noting, marking 50th anniversary of the War on Drugs declared by President Nixon. And today's conversation with uh, Carl Hart is basically a kickoff of a series of events to not only sort of note this important moment, um, but also more importantly to talk about what we've learned from half a century of the war on drugs and what is next. Uh, so there's really no better person to ask this question than Carl Hart, uh, who just published his second book titled Drug Use for Grown-Ups. Um, he's a scientist uh, and a professor at Columbia University. He's also a friend. Um, Carl, I read your book twice, cover to cover, and uh, and I very much uh, hope that our audience has too, and if not, will be inspired to do so um, after this conversation. So, uh, great to see you. Thank you for joining us, and congrats. Um, uh, I enjoyed your first book a lot, and this one as well. Good to see so, you, Kasia. Nice, nice to have you with us. Um, so um, I've known you for over a decade. Um, I actually tried to look up, uh, I think we met at one of the DPA conferences and I was trying to look up when exactly that was, but I'm pretty much sure that it's over a decade. And in that, during that time, I saw you sort of mor morphing into a, from a scientist uh, to a scientist and a powerful advocate. Um, and you write in your book about some of those moments which made you sort of decide that being scientist on its own and crunching data is not good enough, that you want to speak out and you want to speak out about what you're learning. Um, can you talk a bit about those moments and, and, and why? Yeah, but first I'd just like to say uh, when we met and how we met, uh, it was in Thailand uh, in a strip club. Do you remember? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> and so, uh, um, you know, uh, being a scientist, like you say, being a scientist alone and as opposed to also being an advocate or an activist, uh, I, I don't have the luxury um, to just stay in the lab. Uh, without uh, uh, connecting the dots to real people's lives because the people who are most often negatively impacted by what we do in science, particularly drug science, are people who look like me, people who I care about, my children. Um, and then so when I see drug policy, for example, being made, um, with data or using data or justified with data like those that I collect, um, it's infuriating. And then it's even more infuriating when other scientists uh, don't say anything because they know better too and they haven't been out here. Um, and it's that kind of apathy um, uh, goes against the spirit of what I thought America was about. Clearly I was wrong. Um, and so I don't have the luxury, and, and that's why I, I write um, uh, in the popular press. I, I try and uh, speak uh, to a more general audience, um, and I try to uh, make sure my readers and public know that I'm human. Uh, so when George Floyd dies from a knee on his neck, and then they're trying to blame drugs for the cause of his death, Every scientist who studied drugs should have been up in arms. And so uh, as a public, we should look around at those scientists who study drugs and they were silent. And we should be asking them, fuck is wrong with you? Um, and so uh, those are some of the reasons why I uh, do what I do. 
And so, um, you know, from, from where we sit at Open Society Foundations, um, since we are a foundation, we often do get requests uh, for larger research pieces, bigger research pieces. And one of the first questions that we ask, can that research be, be translated into a public discourse, into public policy? Because if not, I think we, again, as a foundation, which has limited amount of uh, uh, funding for reform agenda, right? I think it's important that our funding is very much about in support of the reform agenda. We uh, want to make sure that people actually use it to change the world, right? And so, and so that's why it's actually quiet. You know, I really appreciate the work you do because not many people do do that. And um, and uh, I think it's you know it it takes a certain amount amount of um, certain of commitment to actually the issue that you study to speak out. Um, and equally, similarly to you, I am disappointed that you know not every scientist with 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 um, laboratories behind them actually speaks out in in a moment like this, which is a dramatic moment where where uh, George, George Floyd's death is actually trying to be uh, made about drugs rather than about a terrible killing that we all want. Um, so, you know, one reason why I really enjoy sort of watching your road uh, towards uh, advocacy um, is because I sort of feel like, you know, mine is a little Parallel. So I grew up, as you know, in Poland, in communist Poland. And when I left at 18, I very much left with the notion that drugs, you know, are the sort of Western, um, Western problem. Uh, and that, you know, once you start, that's it, right? Once you, when you start, once you start on that road, then basically your life is over. And so, so I sort of came to the U.S. with that notion and actually you know, it's a little, I mean, humorous now, but actually the first person, friends of mine, college student that told me that they smoked pot the night before, like I was really horrified. I was horrified for them, horrified to a point where I felt like, wow, maybe I should like call their parents. And so, you know, from, from that time when I was 18, now, you know, I very much agree with you that ending prohibition should really be our priority. But it's not something that happened, you know, in a year or in a month or even, you know, as I become became a professional actually in the field of HIV. It was harm reduction to sort of brought me to a place where where uh, I understood drugs differently. And so, um, you know, when I traveled uh, to a room in China, when I saw people coming for to methadone clinic in a very sort of complicated uh, environment, when I traveled in Tomsk in Russia and Siberia, and I saw folks coming into a needle exchange program, you know, in freezing weather, waiting for a bus, you know, for, for an hour to get there just for some needles and actually someone to talk to them. It sort of, you know, it, 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 was, it was so clear to me that everything that we hear, which is that drug users don't care about their health and that they do not, they do, you know, they only care about themselves. But none of this is really true, right? People were really committed to themselves, to their communities. And so, so that's the point that your book makes, right? The point yes. is that basically the assumptions that we have about people that use drugs are just wrong. And, and can you talk a bit about those assumptions and sort of how, and some of your discoveries, you know, and your $5 payment and what that means? Because I learned about it just in a different setting. Yeah, uh, this is a serious sort of uh, comment here. It's like, I believe it was in 2009, you and I were coming back from Bangkok and we were going to the airport. Um, and we were talking about um, what our roles are in the world, in this world. And, um, you know, we had some lofty ideals about what we we're supposed to do or what we, ex we expect from each other and so forth. And um, so my trajectory is also based upon our sort of friendship and um, our professional uh, interactions. And 
uh, as you point out, as I traveled around the world and made these discoveries, um, it was in part because of you and OSF uh, that I was able to do that sort of thing. And, and in doing so, um, I guess one of the most striking things that I discovered is that, well, uh, given that uh, the illicit drug trade is a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, poor people alone could not support this industry. And most of the consumers, the people who are supporting that industry, are middle, class, middle to upper class people. And in my travels, um, I have gotten high with many of these people. Of course, I won't say who they are, but they have been government officials, captains of industry, academics, uh, famous people. Uh, and of course, they care about their community, themselves, their loved ones. Of course they do, just as people who don't have as much money or as, ma as, as many resources. Um, and one of the major things that they are doing, uh, one of the major reasons that they use drugs is to alter their consciousness, to feel better, to have a good time, to make connections, to be more empathetic, to be more open. All of these pro-social things that we say we value in a society. But when we see the depictions of drugs in the movies, uh, in our newspaper articles, uh, in our documentary films, on our news coverage, the depiction of drug use is always some sensationalistic uh, cautionary tale because that is sexy and the public consumes that and eats it up. It would be quite boring for a filmmaker to make a film, uh, say, with a heroin user. Uh, she uses on the weekends. Uh, she goes to work on Monday and Friday. She handles all of her business. She's a decent person. Where's the drama in that? Uh, but that's the typical person who uses drug. Um, uh, but we have this disproportionate representation of the person who is having problems with drugs. Now, um, uh, that's not to say that people don't have problems with drugs. Clearly they do. Uh, that's the only thing we show in our society. So. You don't need me to say that. And so I won't say that as much because we already have a disproportionate uh, uh, over-representation of, of, of those people. Uh, and so my job, uh, as I see it, is to try to bring some reason, some objectivity, uh, some uh, uh, humanity to this here um, uh, study of drugs and, and the advocacy for uh, people who use drugs. Uh, and so the biggest sort of misconception is that uh, those folks who use drugs aren't like us. And it's like, what, what are you talking about? Those people who use drugs, they are us. And that was one of the major points in the book. And that's why I had to come out of the closet and say, you know, hey, I'm in solidarity with the people who you have vilified. Vilify me if you want to vilify someone. I'm someone who as a job, uh, I write books, I write articles, I take care of my family, all of those sort of things. So how can you vilify me? Oh, they've tried, but you know it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't hold water. Uh, and 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 so another sort of ask of the book, one of the major ask of the books, is that uh, for middle class, middle to upper class people who use drugs, get out of the closet. So we can have a more representative view of what a drug user is like. So we will be less likely to vilify someone simply because they acknowledge drug use, simply because of what they put in their bodies. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the sort of final calls to action in the book. Um, and uh, we haven't really, I haven't been allowed to really talk about that. Uh, in previous sort of media discussions about the book. And so I'm glad to have that opportunity that, tonight to be able to ask people to get out of the closet. So, so Carl, um, when I was telling you a while back about why I am really um, excited about 
serving at Boom Festival a number of years ago. Um, for those who do not know, it's a European version of Burning Man, and, and some of us spend time there sort of sitting folks that are having trouble. And, and my description was as follows, that during my first trip to Boom Festival, I was sitting in a sort of eating area where someone who is incredibly under the influence, I'm not sure of what substance, took five minutes to take apart his recycling, right? Here's where the compost is, here's where a cardboard box goes, this is where the little um, the little basket gets returned. And for me, that was a very sort of significant lesson learned, even if it sounds a little naive, because again, you know, I grew up with this assumption that if you are a drug user, all you care about is your drugs. And so, and also that people are completely irrational while under this, under the influence. Well, this guy was, you know, as rational as anyone who is environmentally concerned. And yes. your response, and your response to me was, well, but also think about who this person is. They had to spend money on their ticket to Portugal. They had to pay their fee uh, to get into Boom, right? So this clearly is someone that has their life somewhat together, right, to make that happen. And I think that's an important point that you make in the book, right? That yes, drug use for grown-ups, but let's define grown-ups, right? And it's not above 18. It's people who keep on talking. You know, let, let, let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, so. Are responsible parents, family members, talk about that yes. a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, so the title is Drug Use for Grownups, and, and early on I defined what I mean by a grown-up. Um, growing up is really difficult, and it's not some sort of static process where, oh, you made it, now you're grown up. You know, it's not like that. It's a dynamic process. Some days you are better than others. Some months, weeks, years, you're better than others. Um, and so uh, the way I defined it was just simply somebody who uh, handles their responsibility, they look after themselves, they exercise, they eat well, uh, their drug use is well planned such that um, it is, uh, it takes place uh, when they have set aside time, just like if you're going to a concert, a show or something, you have to set aside a couple hours um, uh, in order to engage in that activity. We recently had the Super Bowl in the U.S. Uh, the Super Bowl is like an all-day affair. Uh, so if you're going to watch the Super Bowl, you have to set aside a time. Uh, many of us don't have that kind of time. You know, it's like the, the Super Bowl, watching the Super Bowl in the U.S. is more of a commitment than taking drugs these days because they have stretched this thing out. And so you have to set aside time so you can, so you meet all your obligations. The same is true with responsible people who are, are using drugs. Um, and, and that doesn't mean um, that uh, people who are irresponsible or not, or they're banned from using drugs. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that when I wrote this book, that's who I had in mind. And, and so if I was going to talk about the wide gamut of drug users or possible drug users, um, it, it would have been a much larger book and it would have taken me another 10 years. And so I uh, called the drug use for grownups and I defined grownups so I could narrow my focus and so I could actually have something to say and not be, and so my message was not so diffused. Um, and so I, I just don't want to offend people uh, who may have been labeled as irresponsible and therefore I'm throwing them away again. That's not what I'm doing. So, so um, I think that's clear. And then uh, what happens when people do get in trouble with drugs? You know, I understand that your sort of call, advocacy call here in this book is sort of ending prohibition, full regulation of recreational market. But there are oh. people, you know, right now who are in- So you, you, got multiple, you got multiple questions. So let's just stay with that one question and then we'll come to the next one. Let's just yeah. think about like the people who get in trouble, right? Um, 
So the thing that one of the thing I, things I lay out in the book is that fact, the vast majority of people who use any drug, from heroin to marijuana, from cocaine to MDMA, any drug, the vast majority of these users will not meet criteria for drug addiction. Uh, only a small percentage will. Now, that tells us, that tells me, that if most of the people who use any drugs are not becoming addicted, that tells me then for the people who become addicted, I must look beyond the drugs themselves. And when we start to look beyond the drugs themselves, we can start figuring out what's going on. For example, we know a large percentage of the people who meet criteria for addiction also have co-occurring psychiatric illness, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, other sorts of things. You treat the illness, uh, the psychiatric illness, and you deal with the drug addiction as well. Uh, other people who may meet criteria for addiction uh, maybe those folks who uh, live in the Midwest, who live in the Rust Belt, uh, and companies like GM moved out of the Rust Belt to uh, countries where they could get cheaper labor. Those middle class jobs are gone, and they're not coming back. Uh, and, but those people who were in those middle class jobs, they were someone in their community. They had purpose. Uh, they took care of their families. That's gone. Uh, th now, those people are more likely to meet criteria for drug addiction and a uh, uh, host of other kinds of problems. Um, and so that's where our focus should be. Then there are people who addiction has a lot to do with um, exercising inhibitory control, responsibility skills. So there are a lot of people who just haven't developed those skills and they just haven't had enough practice with those skills. And so we need to work on those sorts of things for some people, better education, uh, better access to education. People meet criteria for addiction for a myriad of reasons, but uh, the least among them uh, is the drug themselves, the drugs themselves. Uh, so if our society did a better job of taking care of our citizens, we wouldn't have to worry about so much about high rates of addiction. And then you wouldn't have to ask me what about addiction? Um, and, and then I could talk about my favorite subject, drugs. Um, and, uh, but since our society loves to scapegoat drugs for things that we don't want to deal with, it's a deflection strategy. Um, because I assure you, if you make sure people have good psychiatric treatment, access to it, and uh, ability to pay for it, make sure people have gainful employment so they can take care of their families, so they have purpose in their world. You don't have to worry about high rates of addiction. Um, and, um, and so that's what we should be doing. Now you had another question about, about uh, uh, getting rid of prohibition, right? Well, so, so I'll come back to the question of, of prohibition, of getting rid of prohibition. Let me, let me, let me have you talk a bit about, okay, so I, I take your point. There are multiple causes that have some people, some people, I take that point, sort of land in a situation where they're drug dependent. Now, how do we respond to it in a way that actually does not, you know, that is effective, that doesn't further traumatize them? Because I think that's one of the biggest criticisms that I have of drug treatment that people who quote unquote fail walk out of there more traumatized than they walked in. And I think that is a huge problem. So somewhere between, you know, sensible, thoughtful services for folks, what, what would they look like? What would they look like for someone who is dependent and actually wants to stop? What yeah. would it look like for someone who is maybe not dependent, but also needs, you know, clean needle syringes? Talk about what is a sensible sort of portfolio of services to folks that are drug using and are, you know, get, are, are in need of support. I don't want to say get into trouble because that has value judgment attached, but need support. Yeah, so uh, when we think about addiction, uh, we think about the best practices. Uh, the first thing one has to do is to make sure that the individual before you has a comprehensive assessment. So you check out these 11 symptoms which uh, we look at for addiction. Uh, and then you also see what is distressing the person about their drug use and meeting these symptoms. Uh, if you do that first, 
now you can uh, target your treatment to meet or tailor your uh, treatment to be specific for that individual. Now, when we think about the treatment team, you should have a social worker to help the person ne negotiate social services, housing, all of those sort of things that uh, are important for us to get along in this world. The person should have a physician uh, in case you need to have these prescriptions for some ailment like a co-occurring psychiatric illness, and maybe even the substance that they have come to you for. Uh, so that physician can prescribe the, uh, the, the substance so they don't have to worry about uh, being on the street and getting tainted su uh, substance and putting themselves in harm's way. Uh, make sure the person has a psychologist uh, in case there needs to be some uh, psychotherapy, uh, behavioral modification. Uh, make sure the person has uh, uh, other healthcare professionals like nurses and people who are uh, available to them on a, uh, a, a fairly regular basis. Um, and so that treatment team, uh, with, that's, that should be the bare minimum, that treatment team. If the people don't have that kind of treatment team, well, you you are behind the eight ball. Um, that's the bare minimum. All right, and you've made some statements. So so maybe before we go to harm reduction. So right now, I mean, I know it's. I'm asking you. I'm asking a scientist that. Um, well, uh, maybe, we should, maybe we Maybe we should on. say something about overdoses. Because we will. You know, we're, we will. Okay. We will. We'll okay. get there. But if you were to think about sort of drug treatment industry as it exists right now in the US, mm -hmm. what percentage of that drug industry do you think matches what you just described? Put it this way, uh, if I had a loved one who needed treatment in the United States, uh, I would be hard pressed uh, to send them anywhere. Uh, I might send them to Switzerland, um, but I don't know where I would send uh, a loved one in the United States. Okay, so that's a pretty that's a pretty depressing statement on the state of drug treatment at the time when overdose actually, and we'll I'll ask you a question about that in a second, is is a big issue, and I know it's a question of interpretation, and we'll talk about that. So just one word about harm reduction. You know, OSF is heavily invested in harm reduction. I worked in a harm reduction program when I came to OSF. First, we have, you know, many colleagues that are working at the harm reduction program. You know, we look at your chap uh, chapter title and cringe. <laughs> so please talk about that a bit. <laughs> yeah, so it's like harm reduction, the, the concepts and the practices, what people actually do, uh, I'm all for it. I'm a I'm a I'm the biggest supporter, you know, uh providing education, information clean needles, services, who can be against harm, harm reduction? The thing that I uh, took uh, issue with in that chapter was just the term harm reduction, because the term harm reduction is just harm reduction. What we do in harm reduction is just common sense. It's education, it's interventions, it's all of these things. Like when I brush my teeth this morning, that's harm reduction. But we don't call it harm reduction when I brush my teeth or when I put my seatbelt on. We don't call it harm reduction. We only call it harm reduction when it is related to drug use. And so you have this pairing of drug, harm, drug, harm, drug, harm, drug, harm. And that shapes how we think about drugs. It shapes how we behave. It shapes how we talk about drugs. And so the, my only beef was that, well, maybe we should think about renaming harm reduction, but I wasn't, uh, I certainly was not attacking the practice of harm reduction. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, um, um, uh, Robin said to me about this sort of thing, uh, she said that, you know, when people say that you're attacking harm reduction on this point, um, it's like me saying uh, to people, why do you call Mary ugly? You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't call Mary ugly. You shouldn't pair Mary and ugly. And then if somebody would say to me, like, why do you hate ugly Mary? And, and so that's not what I'm saying. I don't hate ugly Mary. I'm trying to say, stop calling, stop pairing ugly with Mary. That's all I'm saying. 
Okay, understood. I think I think my colleagues in the harm reduction program are relieved. Um, yeah, I, I think Mary is beautiful. Uh, I, another term that I've heard you uh, make comments on, I don't think it's in the book, but I think I recently saw it on Twitter. And I think your tweet said, decrim is not where it's at. Oh. And so uh, before, before, before you start answering, okay, here's, here's where my confusion about that tweet lies. In your book, you talk about how great it was to be in Spain where drug possession is decriminalized because yes. you could, you could with your friends there sort of have a civilized, um, civilized uh, event where drugs were involved. Um, yes. There are, as you know, a bunch of states, you know, Oregon passed, uh, Decrim, Washington State maybe next, Maine, New Jersey, Maryland are working on it. You also quoted Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore at de facto decriminalized drug possession, and you yes. spoke of it with affection. And yes. so, so what's up with that tweet? What's wrong with Decrim? <laughs> Um, so I don't do my Twitter account. No, I'm joking. Um, um, so let's talk about Spain, decrim, and Portugal, decrim. Um, so in those places, decrim work. It works. Um, and even in Maine and Vermont and Oregon, it'll work. But when you think about decrim, uh, there are some problems with decrim. Not understand in high price, the first, the second book, not the first, the second book, high price. I was advocating for decriminalization, um, but decrim in the hands of Americans, uh, particularly in locations that are racially diverse. Decrim uh, means less. Let's talk. Let's go back to uh, Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore. They decriminalized uh, cannabis in 2014. Between 2015 and 2017, they made 1,500 arrests for marijuana. That's what this is: marijuana possession, just simple possession. 96% of those people that they arrested were black. Now, um, that's, that's how decrim can play out in places. In New York, we decriminalized marijuana in 1977. But as you know, Harry Levine and Deborah Smalls, those people have documented thousands of black and brown people being arrested for marijuana in the city. And so, uh, I was pointing that out. It's like, if you don't rein in your cops, uh, this over-policing and this sort of racist law enforcement, decrim means nothing to those cops. And Marilyn, uh, I think she's experienced in some of this. That's one. And two, when we think about overdose, now this is, decrim does nothing for overdose uh, because it doesn't touch uh, people, it doesn't touch this notion that uh, the drug supply may be tainted. It doesn't uh, increase any quality control of the supply of drugs on the streets, like legal regulation would do. Legal regulation would make sure we have uh, quality control, regulation. It would be uh, unit doses controlled. So those two things are the things that concern me about decrim in the hands of Americans uh, in these racially diverse places. Um, uh, the cops don't care. You still get this racist law enforcement, uh, racist drug law enforcement, and uh, people can still die from overdoses from obtaining um, tainted drugs because drugs remain illegal. Uh, so that that's what I was, so I'm trying to get people to like say, you know, um, Decrim is okay, uh, but uh, when we think about what the country promises with the Declaration of Independence, just the basic, the first promise, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as long as you don't prevent anybody else from doing the same, you can live your life like you want. That's what the country promises. 
And so when people are bargaining away or doing this in incrementalism, um, I don't have time for it anymore. I'm 54. I have less years uh, left than I've lived. And um, I'm one of the targets of this bullshit. So that's why uh, I feel that way about decriminalization. I, my kids are the targets for that. So I would be a sellout if I didn't push for anything uh, stronger than that. Right. So, so understood. So the ultimate goal is basically ending drug prohibition. The ultimate goal is uh, regulation of recreational use of cannabis. I mean, sorry, of all drugs, <laughs> Re uh, regulation of uh, of um, regulation of all recreational use of all uh, substances that are not illicit, but. Decrim is an okay step on the way with an understanding that that's not the end. Yes, this is where we agree. Uh, you know, it's the reality. I mean, it's just it's just how things work, just how things happen. But it doesn't mean that I will spend my time there. My time is trying to free people. Uh, and so my goal is not not necessarily stopping at drug prohibition. My goal is uh, for us to live like we claim we are the freest people in the world. That's my goal. Um, and so uh, drug policy is just one aspect of, of, of what I'm what I'm doing. And um, so people who are working on decriminalization, more power to you. The people of Oregon, mad props to you. You know, that was a huge win. And, and and I'm sure it will be fine in Oregon. Oregon has, you know, what, 90 some percent white state. They will be fine. OK, understood. So, uh, Carl, um, you said here a second ago that you're worried about your sons, you know, yourself, you're, you're a target. People who look like you are a target. So obviously race and drugs. Um, an important, an important subject, uh, a subject that you wrote beautifully about in, uh, in your first book, uh, in this one. And I think, you know, the stories that you tell about Afro-Colombians in Colombia, Afro-Brazilians in Brazil, uh, obviously Afro, uh, African-Americans. I think if you talk to colleagues, and I'm sure you have, whether it's friends, or whether it's UK, look at who gets stopped. I mean, it's actually amazing that during COVID, the number of stops for for drugs actually w was higher than a year before while people were in a lockdown, which is just, you know, sh shocking piece of data. You know, you go to the south of Europe, uh, Italy, who are people in prison, brown and black faces. You go to Eastern Europe, who are people in prison for drugs, it's the Roma. So, you know, we see this across the world, right? We see this across the world. So talk about that a bit. Talk about that a bit, particularly in the context that we are living right now and the trial that is ongoing. And the fact that, you know, I mean, the fact that a medical professional can articulate that as a potential cause of death of George Floyd, it just truly leaves me speechless. So, what, what, yeah, I know you wrote a great op-ed on that. I know you spoke about that. Um, yeah, if you can talk a bit about your book and what we're living right now. Yeah, so uh, the book was finished before the summer 2020. The book was really finished in February 2020. Uh, but uh, the things that I talked about in the book in terms of like the George Floyd thing, how uh, law enforcement uses drugs as a shield, as a scapegoat for police brutality. Um, I talked about the Laquan McDonald uh, story. This kid in Chicago got 16 times uh, by a police officer, uh, and he was moving away from the police officer. Uh, but the story was that he was on PCP, uh, and they tried to use PCP to excuse this uh, heinous act uh, by this uh, police officer, Van Dyke. Uh, and the Chicago uh, officials, they covered it up for an entire year. 
and so we're seeing the same kind of thing with George Floyd, where they're using what was in his body to excuse, um, or they're trying to, to excuse uh, the uh, callous indifference uh, displayed by Derek Chauvin. Now, in the book, I, I, I take the reader back to the early 1900s when we passed the first drug laws in this country. The first drug law, the uh, federal drug law, was uh, the Harrison Act, and it restricted uh, access to cocaine and opioids. Uh, that was a monumental thing. At the time, the country was not in any mood to be uh, restricting drugs at a federal level because we kind of believed in states' rights. Um, and so they tried to get law, the law passed in 1909. And the reason why they tried to get this law passed was to uh, basically get trade favors from China, to show China we were in solidarity with them with their opioid problem. That's the, that's the reason that we originally tried to get the law passed. And so it didn't work in 1909, but then by 1914, uh, they brought with them this time uh, as their sort of a companion, this mythical uh, coconized Negro, a black person on cocaine. Uh, and this person who was on cocaine couldn't be stopped by 32 caliber bullets. You could shoot the person six times in the heart and not stop them. Uh, and so the Southern police forces uh, moved away from the 32 caliber weapon to the 38 caliber weapon. Um, there was there were claims about black people being more murderous, better marksmen, of course, race, raping white women. All of this led to the first federal laws restricting drug use in this or drug of drug availability in this country. Um, and uh, I guess a few years later, uh, 20 years later or so, we restricted marijuana for similar reasons of uh, its association with Mexican Americans and Black Americans. And so the bottom line is that drugs are not restricted in America because of pharmacology. They are restricted because of racism. And the racism is still with us today in terms of how we think about drugs and who is using what drug. I mean, even within our own community, uh, we think about something like ketamine, uh, an adored psycho psychedelic, PCP. Uh, the two drugs are chemical cousins, produce uh, similar effects. But PCP has been associated with black folks. Ketamine associated with white folks. Ketamine has a great reputation, whereas PCP uh, supposedly gives its users superhuman strength. Uh, you have to shoot people 38 times in order to bring them down. Uh, of course, that's not true. Ketamine produces similar effects as PCP. Uh, PCP. But all of these sort of this racialized sort of way of thinking about drugs, uh, it's who we are as Americans. Okay. And so, um, yes, uh, and it's who we are as Americans, but it's also who we are across the globe, right? Because this is what you've know, this is what you know so well. Yes. You know, yes. your 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 sort of uh, your disagreement to the to the term Krakolandia was, you know, a big eye opener for me. I traveled to Brazil. Everyone said Krakolandia, so did I, right? So, so it actually, so it's not just United States, and and I guess. No, you're right. You're, you're right. See, we export our drug policy abroad. So yes, you're right. So, so that was going to be my next question or comment. Do we export our drug policy, and can U.S. be blamed on for all that's wrong with drug uh, drug policy across the globe, or you know? Do we have such sort of inherent, particularly in the global north, sort of um, disagreement with drug use that that under the umbrella of, of the UN and also US leadership, countries manage to sort of yeah, repeat the same pattern, right? Which is which is blame basically use use drugs and drug policy to repress the poor the most marginalized, 
sort of the uh, people who actually, if anything, need most support and compassion? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that politicians all around the globe has learned, and they may have learned it from us, is that when we think about when people are elected to office, they get like two or four year terms, maybe six year terms. Uh, in that time, uh, the, the cycles between elections, that's a short amount of, not a short amount of time. One of the things politicians have learned is that all you have to do is trump up a, a drug crisis and then you can say, we're going to put more cops on the street. That's an easy sort of thing. Uh, uh, relative, it, 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 you are increasing employment, even though uh, uh, it's not uh, the, the, the employment that uh, people need, uh, but you are increasing employment and you are uh, giving the appearance that you are dealing with the crux of the problem, when in fact you're not dealing with the crux of the problem, but that's okay because the people who will be negatively affected by this sort of policy or this sort of strategy are people who you don't care about. And so in these places like the Philippines, it's the poor, uh, Brazil is the poor black and brown, uh, even Northern Ireland is the poor folks. Uh, and, and so it's the people who the politicians don't necessarily care about. And we as a society uh, are not so upset about either because otherwise our prisons wouldn't look like they do. Uh, and so the politicians know it's a win-win strategy that you can do over and over. And um, everybody wins. Uh, newspaper uh, reporters win. They write stories about the drug crises. Uh, politicians uh, get a chance to do these press conferences and talk about how tough they're going to be uh, or they're going to have some new treatment that doesn't end up with a job for the people who have treatment. It's really a joke, but people think that, oh, they're being compassionate because uh, they're talking about treatment. That's not compassionate. All right, Carl. So I have a long list of questions. Uh, and before we get there, I actually want to ask you quickly about two countries. So you write with a lot of uh, with a lot of admiration for Switzerland, and I'm in agreement with you. Heroin maintenance programs, safe consumption rooms, uh, incredibly, incredibly comprehensive program. Um, but you know, Switzerland happened in a certain context, right? Yes. Because I think what you write about it is you describe Switzerland now. But the reality is that the reason why safe consumption rooms came into existence, why heroin maintenance program became uh, possible, is was a pretty, Debbie. pretty overwhelming HIV epidemic, right? And the needle parks. Yeah. And so what happened is that it took the political will. I mean, it took the political will of people like Ruth Dreyfus and others that we know, right, Ambrose Ochtenhagen and others, to actually make that possible. Right. Yes. And so what you describe in the book now is what we have now and what we're learning from it. Yes. But I think another learning is that there was a trigger and a and bunch of people that were pragmatic and smart enough to actually go there. Yes. And so and so a question, you know, another point which just may be interesting to folks that are listening to us, that I think about 15 years ago, Switzerland had a, run a referendum whether heroin maintenance programs, which were at a pilot sort of stage should now be available to everyone. And I was, uh, who needs them, who needs them. And so I was astonished to read that something like 70% of the Swiss actually responded. I mean, just think about that, right? Should heroin maintenance be a standard treatment for people who need it? And 70% of the Swiss actually had an opinion about it. And again, majority of them voted yes. So I sort of feel like, you know, the work that has happened in Switzerland over two or three decades now is just enormous. And what you're seeing now is precisely sort of the result of that. And I raise this because my question is, you know, what needs to happen in the U.S.? What needs to happen here in this country for a radical change to be embraced? And so, yeah. you know. 
we now are talking over 2020, the worst year for overdose, right? Is that it or, or not? So I know there are three different questions in one here. So see how you want to respond. Yeah, so I, I do talk about the, the precipitating uh, HIV crisis in, in Switzerland. I mentioned that, I just don't dwell on it, but certainly I mention it because uh, you introduced me to Ambrose, so I, I know that story. Um, now, in terms of the United States, uh, do we have a precipitating crisis? Are you kidding? Um, of course we do. The question is, do we care? Uh, if we had, uh, if we may have had just uh, the population of Vermont deciding uh, what to do uh, based on their population, we might have a different result. Uh, because in Switzerland, you know, it's one of the most homogenous places on the planet. It's really white, and they see people as their brothers and sisters and so forth. In the United States, we don't. Uh, we are uh, racially diverse, ethnically diverse. And so um, the crisis that we are subjected to or we are experiencing, uh, people easily dismiss that as that's those other people. Um, that's why we haven't had real, real action. Like, just, just quickly, this is so easy to deal with, this sort of overdose crisis. Just make sure we have drug purity checking centers in the United States where people can submit small samples of their drug and then get a chemical, uh, get a, a printout of the uh, chemical analysis of what is contained in the substance if there is an adulterant in it, they know not to take it or take it in lower doses uh, very easily. We have the technology, it's not that expensive. They do it in Colombia, they do it in Austria, Spain, you know this. Uh, this, is not, this is not difficult. So when I hear politicians, I hear the so-called public health experts uh, talking about the overdose crisis, if they're not talking about this, I don't wanna hear what, I don't wanna hear what they have to say because it's disingenuous. It's just completely disingenuous. Uh, and so the question is, um, uh, we will change that uh, in action. Uh, the moment we start to see the people who are dying as our brothers and sisters, not a minute before. So, so you saw uh, that um, Biden's administration put out a document which which um, in response to the, the plan, uh, in response to the uh, overdose crisis. And they are actually allowing for federal money to be spent on fentanyl strips, which, which actually taking into account that not that long ago, you know, that's a joke. Harvard, that's in, that's a joke. So, yeah, so let's talk about that. Tell me what yeah, you think. That's a joke. I mean, it, it, it's like, uh, all right. Uh, when I was writing this book, I was thinking a lot about, and so Stonewall happened in '69, and so we just passed the 50th uh, anniversary. Stonewall, of course, is the gay community in New York and uh, the raid. Uh, in 1969, those folks were dehumanized, um, and the police harassed them. They were arrested. Um, and now in 2021, uh, we all say that's horrible. And we all say, uh, um, uh, they shouldn't have done that. Now, uh, we have now become enlightened as a society, but the people who were subjected to that, they hadn't, they haven't become more human. They are still the same people they were. And so why should they have to wait on my acknowledgement of their humanity for them to have to be treated like humans. That's what we're saying with these uh, fentanyl strips. We know it's a joke and we know people will die because fentanyl strips, I mean, the people on the streets who, who had them, I mean, bless their heart, they had to do something. But when you have the government saying, we're gonna give you fentanyl strips as, instead of um, uh, real analysis, it's a joke. It's the government saying we're not ready to recognize your humanity because the fentanyl strips only detect whether or not fentanyl is there, not the amount, not other substances. 
It's a joke. And for people to like uh, think that or act as if that's progress, then uh, how would they like to be treated less than human until someone is ready to recognize their humanity? That's that's the stuff. And and can you talk a bit about thanks for that? And can you talk about overdose? And I I feel I feel yeah. like I'm running out of my time, but I have one more question to ask you. So just very quickly, because I, I think what people often hear you say is that there is no overdose problem. What I hear you say is that there's no opioid overdose problem. So can you can you clarify? Agree with one, disagree with the other, yeah. disagree with both. Where, where are you? Just so, so in the book, I hope people I hope people really read this chapter, chapter three, the harm reduction chapter. I painstakingly show people how the data are collected. And the data uh, vary from location to location. And most of the people doing death investigations are coroners. And in most places in the United States, the only level of education a coroner needs is a high school diploma and needs to be a registered voter. Uh, medical examiners, of course, also do uh, death investigations as well, and they have an MD and they have training in pathology, uh, but most of the people doing this are coroners. And so you have this uneven sort of reporting of deaths in, in that um, what is sometimes classified as an opioid overdose, there isn't any biological uh, um, um, uh, confirmation. Um, or like it is in most cases, most overdoses involve multiple drugs. But what we have done, because we think we now see it sexy and it has some currency, what we say, if an opioid was there, then it's an opioid overdose. And we know that overdose from an opioid, one opioid alone, is not an easy thing to do uh, for people who have some experience with opioids. But when you combine it with other, sed other sedatives, now you increase the likelihood of overdose. And so uh, that impacts our education. I mean, we could simply make sure or help people to understand that if you're going to be using opioids, uh, particularly for some extended period in a, sh uh, in a night or something, just please don't combine it with another opioid uh, or another sedative because you might in it increases the likelihood of respiratory depression. Another thing we know about, uh, about overdose deaths is that many people are dying because they get a uh, substance uh, tainted with something like fentanyl and they were expecting oxycodone or heroin. Uh, fentanyl, of course, is a lot more potent, meaning that uh, smaller amounts of it is needed to produce an effect, including overdose. Uh, and so drug checking would take care of that problem. Uh, and so what I do say about the overdose crises is that this is easy to fix, uh, but we're pretending like it's a difficult problem. And right. another, thing, another thing about the opioids thing that really is disturbing me is that our uh, hysteria about opioids has made it damn near impossible for chronic pain patients to get prescriptions for opioids. Many of these people have been on uh, uh, opioid medications for one decade, two decades, three decades, and they've been fine. And now we want to cut them off because of our hysteria? That's not right. Uh, and so uh, those people kind of suffer in silence. Uh, many of them are committing suicide. Um, and so those kind of things, they, they disturb me. Understood, understood, and I think many of us at OSF are equally disturbed um, about, yes, about how the discussion about overdose takes place and also about cutting people off from, from medicine that they need. So last question for me, and you know, you can be super quick or not, and maybe we actually, this will be a place where we disagree. You, talk, you write a lot about Brazil, you write about Rio, you write around uh, uh, about one of the favelas, Mare, where you talk about the role of the police and the ever sort of visible presence of the police and how how disturbing that is. So I visited Mare before you, number of times. And the way that we were able to enter that favela 
was with very clear set of instructions from people who run it, basically drug industry. And we couldn't enter, you know, we could enter only in a car that had windows open because they needed to see who is inside. No pictures were allowed, let's say 15 years ago, no cameras were allowed. Uh, you know, we had conversations and met with people and there were people with rifles, not police, civilians, right, pointing at us. So, you know, that favela was run by drugs industry. Right, that was not a pleasant experience entering that favela. Now, couple of, fast forward a couple of years later, you're there, and basically you describe quite eloquently, Mara, with heavy police presence. Neither one of those options are optimal. And please hear me, I think the role of the police and the murders in Rio and Brazil just are horrific. Where is a solution? Where is a solution between favela that is run basically by, I mean, I don't like that term, but drug lords and violent cops? Because I think these are the two realities that we've experienced. What's the middle ground? Well, where people are I, safe? I, I, I don't know if I'm not looking for a middle ground, I'm looking just for justice. So when you, like you say, the the people who are considered drug cartels. Now, by the way, these people have all kinds of other businesses. They would be like our mob. They're not just drug dealers, but that's the sexy thing to say. That's one group that's there, but the group that runs most uh, more favelas than anybody are the militia. And these are off-duty police officers, retired police officers, um, they have a greater proportion of ownership of the favelas. And then you have the police who are on duty. Uh, and so the sort of mob is not necessarily the biggest player there. But the reason why you have these various um, industries or organizations pop up is because the government does not provide the basic services for people in the favelas. And so when you don't have the government providing those services, people will step in and do it. I mean, when someone gets killed, you need someone to like pay for the funeral and do all the rest of these things. The mob in some cases take care of that. In other cases, the militia, uh, the police, all of these people are there to control the territory, to control the businesses that are in the favelas. And so, um, it's uh, it's what you would expect when the government uh, has abdicated its responsibility. That's on the government. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So let's go to questions, and there are many. Um, one of them about Europe. So the question states, you praise European drug policies, but we aren't seeing much more movement from the continent. And as you might have heard, you know, a, a law that we were really hoping for, uh, it looks like uh, was not passed. And so DCRIM in Norway, the most promising country in terms of reform in Europe at the current moment is not gonna happen. So what, what's your response to the sort of, you know, lack of movement, lack of, lack of um, any reform energy in Europe, uh, in Europe at the moment? Well, you know, uh, in many places in Europe, uh, people are fine uh, in terms, they're not having this intense law enforcement pressure on people who use drugs, people who deal drugs. Uh, and so, uh, like in Switzerland, where you had the precipitating event of HIV infections and so forth, uh, there isn't a crisis that uh, is forcing people uh, people's hand in, in, in this case. Uh, and um, they are, uh, relative to us, uh, still respecting people's right to uh, have a good time. Uh, and, and so I'm not sure uh, we're going to see much more movement until there is a crisis. Thanks for that. I hope you're wrong because to the, to the global, sort of reform movement, Europe is actually crucial and movement, movement in Europe is crucial. Well, so we I, should, 
we should we should encourage our friends to get out of the closet. Our friends in government, our friends in industry, um, they need to get out of the closet so that people can see that this behavior is uh, quite prevalent among the movers and shakers in society. And until that happens, uh, what what do they expect? Okay, another question. How are you dealing with the pushback from the book? What advice do you have for people who use drugs who don't have the same protections as you? Uh, you know, that question, the same protections as me, that's nonsense. I mean, people come at me all the time. I mean, I have, uh, you know, my department at the medical school, you know, they plot against me. I mean, people, uh, I mean, these are things like my mail is opened and all of these things. So people talk about protections. Shit, I'm a black man in America. I don't have any protections. Uh, I am trying to make sure if I get screwed, it's going to be a public event and the blood will be on everybody's hand. But this notion that I have some sort of protections, that I hope somebody will try to be a black man in America for a minute and then say that to me about these protections. Um, and so I... I don't uh, that, that that comment, as you see, it's offensive, uh, given the shit that I have to deal with for having acknowledged uh, that I uh, alter my consciousness and I am also a good member of this society. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's cowardly. OK, next Wednesday, a bill that seeks to regulate coca, coca leaf is going to be debated in the Colombian Senate. In your experience, what recommendations would you make to senators who oppose this law? Because they say it will increase drug use in adolescents and young people. Uh, in the book, you will notice I do not talk to politicians. This is not aimed at politicians. Uh, like I said, I have less number of years on earth than I have already spent. And so I'm not wasting my time with politicians. I, my message is aimed at the people, the people who vote for these politicians. When the people who vote for these politicians let the politicians know this is what they want, this is what the politicians will do. Uh, it's really simple. And so don't ask me to talk to politicians. I have no interest. Got it. And you don't advise others to do that either. No, I, we have to educate the people. The people have the power. All right, so there's one question about decrim, and I'm going to ask it because maybe I'm thinking that our conversation did not make it clear. So you are saying that decrim is not the answer. So what is a realistic ideal? I, I don't know what that means. I mean, you know, people are, it's like people can do two things at one time. So there are people who are working on decrim and you know uh more power to them and uh, i i salute them uh, uh the thing that i i am not uh uh playing politics i am just trying to do what's right why should someone tell a responsible person somebody who's an adult how could you tell me what i can put in my body i mean if i harm someone yes there are laws and i should be locked up but I'm putting something in my body and I'm not bothering anyone. Actually, I'm become I'm a better person for it. Uh, what's not clear about that? I mean, that's that's the goal. OK, um, I'm not sure that you actually want to comment, but I'll ask since it's here. Um, you know, one of the drug treatment strategies in the US for opioid is methadone what's your what what are your thoughts on actually let me just rephrase this a little bit on the quality of methadone programs in the united states and how uh, would you improve them if you have if you have suggestions um uh, so i would like i said earlier uh, at a bare minimum you want the person to have a treatment team a social worker to help them with their the social issues and to, go, to help them to negotiate um, this society, housing, employment, all of those sorts of things. A psychiatrist or a physician who can help prescribe other, me other medications that they may need. A psychologist uh, for therapy, uh, behavioral modifications and other sort of things. 
uh, other healthcare professionals uh, to meet uh, needs and be on, so they can be on call and available to folks. That's a bare minimum. Um, if people have that sort of support, uh, I think that uh, that they will be on the way to uh, improving. Okay. Um, let me let me just okay. People started coming out as gay when there was some social benefit, where there was a community affinity recognition uh, from peers, sex partners. What needs to be sort of built in order, you know, build into uh, this assumption that coming out will actually have value and that it will result in what you are hoping it will result in? I, I, I don't understand the question completely. I think. Um, um, because it, it confused me. Uh, so there has to be uh, a reward for the people who come out. Is that the question? I'm sorry. Oh, or maybe safety, or maybe you know, or, or or maybe sort of community, community sort of safety and protection. So you're not the only you know out there standing. Um. So uh, whenever you are demanding your rights and standing up, there is a risk. Uh, when we think about all of all of our heroes throughout history, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, all of those people, they took a risk. They got beat up, but they were standing up for what was right. Uh, and so if the questioner is asking me to guarantee their safety, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Okay. Um, what drug has had the most positive impact on your life? Um, that's a, so like when I get those questions about the drug and so forth, um, it's like saying, what sexual position do you like best? That's a deeply personal sort of thing, and I'm an adult, uh, and um, I don't know who that person is. Why, why, why would I share that with someone? That's not what, um, if, if I'm writing about a drug and I'm talking about those experiences, that's cool. But people, I know this is a new sort of uh, space for us in America because we've been so damn adolescent about drugs. But if people would just think about uh, drug use in our society as a deeply personal thing now, because we're um, uh, because we're so adolescent, and someone like me is being open that I use drugs, it doesn't mean that I'm going to share with you all of these kind of things. It's just you know because that's something that I'm going to hold on to for myself or for people who I know, love, uh, and care about. Okay. So, so Carl, uh, one more question that I want to ask you is music. You write beautifully about music and how, you know, I, 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 yeah, talk about that a bit. Music and drugs, m music minus drugs, what, uh, what, um, yeah, what, what, how did music contribute to where you are today? Yeah, you know, I was a DJ back in the day, uh, and so uh, my head, uh, places, location, um, all of those things I remember uh, and associated with a song or an artist. And so um, uh, I, uh, so I like to write, and the setting when I write, the setting is always music. When I write. There's music in the background, uh, and the music that I uh, like to write to most often, of course, is uh, like 70s soul for the most part, or, or just my mom's sort of soundtrack, um, gospel soul, um, uh, sometimes some folk music uh, from the Canadians, but uh, just music that said something that speaks to my soul, because Art, some artists like uh, like Jody Mitchell, for example, uh, they give you a piece of them when they put out their work. And so when I write, I like to have something that says, are you hiding? Uh, because those artists, they don't hide. They give you some of them for that composition. 
And so uh, I'm trying to give the reader some of me in that space. Great, thank you. Um, a person is asking, uh, a person from Chicago is telling us that there is a wait list of over one year for treatment. Um, and people are prosecuted for self-medicating. Uh, I assume that that person is speaking about the risk that he or she uh, perceives by taking mm, by taking drugs as self medication. Um, any sort of words of wisdom to that individual? Yeah, um, it is important for all of us to stand in solidarity with that individual. Uh, so when officials in 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 Chicago, public officials stand up and talk about their concern for the opioid crises. Don't worry, they'll be doing this in the next coming weeks. They, uh, it's the it's the latest thing that won't, uh, that, that promise that always has a payoff for the politician. So when those politicians stand up, we should organize uh, groups of people uh, to go and uh, uh, heckle those people and say, if you really cared, you will make sure treatment is uh, uh, readily available. You will make sure that drug checking facilities are really readily available. If you don't do those things, uh, why are you here? We don't want to hear you. Boo the person off the stage. Um, be like, act up. Okay, I think, you know, I, I'm tempted to say that this is a great ending. Um, I think many of us here on that call uh, have history in, uh, in responding to AIDS. So be like ACT UP uh, sounds like, uh, like great advice for, um, yeah, for all of us thinking how to respond to, um, you know, what messages to put out there as we talk about the 50th anniversary and the time and the awful consequences of, of those 50 years. But I want to give you a chance to say anything that, you know, anything that you want to say that questions didn't ask or I didn't ask. Uh, yeah, I, uh, fine. I, the thing that I want to just leave people with is this sort of thing. Um, respect yourself enough to think that you have the right to make the decisions about what you put in your body. If you don't respect yourself enough to have that decision, don't try to prevent other people from having that decision because it's un-American. Okay, and so that is the main premise of the book um, that Carl published recently, Drug Use for Grown-Ups, um, highly recommended, food for thought, regardless of which, which side, of the debate you are, or whether you think that legalization is a solution um, or not, um, Carl, thank you very much for thank you very much for uh, spending this time with us. Um, again, this, this discussion with Carl uh, and this conversation about about sort of his progress from from researcher to researcher advocate is the beginning of, of a longer series that we will be hosting um, as we are commemorating the 50 years of the war on drugs. Carl, as always, I admire your work. I admire your um, integrity. Thank you very much for being with thank, us. Thank you, thank you, Kasia. You, you know, you have uh, been instrumental uh, in my development uh, into uh, activism and advocacy, and um, uh, were not for you, I wouldn't be able. I wouldn't have been able to see all the places that I saw in the world. Um, so you are as much responsible for this work as anyone. So thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.